Hi and welcome back to this final video on decision trees where I'm going to be looking at how to do decision trees in, in R. So we've covered um, categorical decision trees, that the more useful continuous decision trees, um, and it's those that I'm going to concentrate on this time when looking at how to, how to do them in R. I'm going to look at how to build them and then how to prune them as well. So if you've looked at, if you've seen my previous videos which have got things to do with R and it'll have some of the basic information on how to do it. I, I, I always use R Studio when I'm using R um, and I usually use the same kind of approach which is first use the libraries and then import the data. So the libraries I'm using are OpenXLS X2 which I found is the fastest way of importing um, Excel data um, and then a couple of libraries rpart and rpart.plot which allow me to do the decision tree work and also display the results of the data. So the first thing I do is I read in and display the data. So uh, the first line of code, the uh, data file and the arrow pointing into it, reads in that particular file and it reads in sheet 5 of that file. Then a display data file, which is the file I've just read in, just to make sure that I've got what I've expected. And then one thing I need to do is the first column, which is the one which has the information on whether um, a firm is solvent or insolvent, which I've put in as 1 or minus 1, I need to convert that to a factor. If I don't convert it to a factor, it'll get treated as a number and the analysis will think that it's supposed to be doing a regression analysis rather than a categorical analysis. So if I turn to a factor, um, I will recognise it as a, um, a factor, a label rather than a value, and it will treat it accordingly and will have um, categorical decision tree, which is which is what we're trying to do. So run that code. Um, everything looks right. We've got there 590 firms in this data set, and I've converted happily the uh, first column, the solvency column, into factors. Next, we'll try and fit a decision tree using the uh, entropy approach, um, as well as doing the calculations which allow later pruning. So. Although we've got some code in here which um, will allow us to do the pruning, when we look at the initial tree which we'll display, this will be an unpruned tree. All we're doing is we're doing the calculations to create a, um, a, a, a file, a, a, an object, which has that information in it for the pruning but doesn't actually do the pruning. It, it, it'll become clear um, a little bit later on. So the function that we use is our part. And you'll see the first part of it is essentially the same as any kind of regression. You've got your regressor, which is solvency. You've then got the things that you are using to determine this, which is a line of those four items with plus in the middle. Where are we getting this from? Where's the data from? Well, data equals data file. So that's the, the data that we input originally. Method is class. That means we're doing a classification um, a decision tree rather than a regression one. And then... Uh, in terms of parameters, palms, uh, split equals information. That means we're using entropy rather than uh, Gini impurity. And then this control thing here under rpart.control, um, the minimum number of splits, the minimum bucket size, the maximum depth, um, use surrogate, and, and xval, that's, that's the cross-validation um, approach. So that's the testing across various different trees to see how stable they are, which, as I say, this search doesn't get used for the initial tree, but it's information which is saved for, say, for later. And then PRP is what actually um, displays the tree, which is um, D-tree entropy. Um, VARLEN and FACLEN, setting those equal to zero, that's essentially just determining how many characters are shown in the labels, and that sets it to all of them. And um, extra equals one. The extra parameter, there's a whole load of different choices you get, and it's basically just what extra information do you get shown at each node in the decision tree? And then digits equal four, how many significant figures do your probabilities get shown as, or do, you, do your numbers get shown as? So run that, code on the left, and you end up with this decision tree here, um, which starts on log of assets over liabilities, then moves through to free cash flow over assets, retained earnings over assets, and EBIT over assets. Um, if you want to go back to the last video I did, you'll notice that the numbers in here are gratifyingly exactly the same as the numbers that I managed to get through Excel. 
um, which I was um, both pleased and surprised at that my fairly clunky Excel approach, which did take me considerably longer than doing an R, it did work. But what you've got here is a decision tree where on the left is your yes answer, on your right is the no answer. And for each of those, it shows you the, um, the, the factor or the value that you're arriving at. So for the first one, it's one, so it's solvency. And you've got three insolvent firms and 456 solvent firms. So that's pretty good. Um, if you go right over to the left, you end up with a minus one, so insolvent, and you've got 14 insolvent firms and two solvent firms. So this basically shows you, it's a way of showing you how well it is doing at these different levels of classification. So this bit is going to be quite dull for this particular decision tree because uh, the answer will look exactly like the original tree. But anyway, um, what we are trying to do is we are trying to prune. And we're going to do this using um, what's called a complexity parameter. So the complexity parameter is something which tells you how much the information gain needs to improve as a proportion of the initial entropy to actually bother putting um, another node in the decision tree. So if you've got a low complexity parameter, it means you're happy with relatively low increases in information gain. If you've got a high complexity parameter, it means you've got fewer levels. So you need to have quite significant information gain to, to justify extra branches on your tree. Now, this is done using cross-validation, which I talked about in the um, last series of talks on support vector machines in the final episode, I think. Um, and because it uses cross-validation, which is a kind of a randomized process, the answer will change on each um, iteration that you have, unless you set the random seed um, at the start. So anyway, here's the, here is the uh, code that we use. The first thing we want to do is we want to print the complexity parameters and look at the um, cross-validation error that we get. So a lower level of, of error is, is better. We want to prune the tree based on that target complexity parameter. So that's just using the function prune and setting the complexity parameter that we want to have. And then we can simply just plot the pruned tree. So if you run this code, what we find is that when we print the complexity parameters, the um, complexity parameter which gives us the lowest cross-validation error is complexity parameter of 0 0.01. So we put that into our um, calculations um, and calculate a pruned tree based on that complexity parameter, then print that tree and we find it's exactly like the tree that we had before, which isn't particularly exciting, but, but, but never mind, it, it does get better, I, I, I promise you. So this is what happens if we use Gini impurity instead. Um, we get something different in terms of order, but also in terms of pruning. And again, you know, the changing seed will change these results um, because cross-validation is, is random. So you'll see here what we've got is um, the main change we have is split equals Gini. Um, so that shows that we're using Gini impurity. Um, and the pruned number uh, that we end up with is, uh, in this example, 0 0.041667. So um, using this calculation initially, you find you've got a much, much bigger tree. And also, you're not starting with log of assets over liability, you're starting with retained assets over earnings. So you do get different numbers, as well as one which has got many, many more branches. You've got one which um, is actually in, in a different order. So what we can see here is, uh, if we move to the complexity parameters, the one with the lowest cross-validation error, it actually has a complexity parameter, parameter much higher, 0 0.041667. And if we prune the tree accordingly, we end up with far fewer branches. If we'd have left it, I mean, it gives the same cross-validation error actually as uh, a complexity parameter of 0 0.020833, and that does leave you with a more complex tree still, but it just shows you how much power um, increasing that complexity parameter and requiring um, a greater increase in information gain can have. So that's it for decision trees broadly. Um, 
it's also worth talking about um, how we can make these trees more robust. And, and not just these trees, but also any kind of classification approach. And there's, there's two key pro approaches I want to look at. And these are boosting and bagging. So boosting is based on the idea of having weak and strong learners, um, which means the correlation with a true classification. So a learner is a classifier, such as, such as a decision tree. So a weak learner is a classifier or a decision tree that doesn't perform very well. So, you know, maybe a little bit better than random, but not much. A strong learner is a classifier which performs very well. And boosting turns weak learners into, into strong learners. So the algorithms are iterative. And what they try to do is they try to learn which classifiers, which decision trees are, are weak, and then try to weight them accordingly. So you, you, you take your weak classifiers, you weight, weight them and you combine them to create a single strong classifier. Bagging, on the other hand, this is bootstrap aggregating. And it involves using a classifier such as a decision tree with subsets of the original training set, which you choose with replacement. So if you've got 590 um, firms, you take maybe 150 and you fit your tree on that. Then you take another 150, which might be uh, include some of the original ones, you fit your tree to that, and so on. And you do this, um, so, so you're choosing with replacement, um, but the set you've got, actually, the, so slightly wrong what I said, the set you've got is actually the same size as your original set, but um, it's going to have some duplicates in there. And you repeat this with further groups of, uh, of subsets from the original data. And then what you do is you then test this on what's called the outer bag subset, so the information which hasn't been pulled into your, into your training set to test the accuracy of the model fit. Now, random forests, which you may have heard of, these are a particular type of bagging algorithm. And they don't just resample the data, they also randomly select the features which are used in the model. So the actual structure of the tree is going to be randomized. So um, it's just going one level further in terms of that um, uh, bootstrapping approach in terms of reusing the data. Now, all of these ensemble techniques can be used for a wide range of classification models. So you don't just have to use them in decision trees, but KNN, support vector machines, all of these can um, be augmented by uh, bagging and boosting um, your, your data. So it's not just something for decision trees. One way of thinking about boosting and bagging is in terms of these idea of bias and variance, which are the two main sorts of model error that you've got. Um, so bias means that you're consistently off target in a particular direction. And variance means that you're not very good at hitting the target. So this has been demonstrated or this has been shown in terms of this kind of target um, approach here. So we've got low bias and low variance. Everything's grouped together and pretty much on target. High bias and low variance, everything's grouped together, it's just in the wrong place. High variance and low bias means it's more or less on target, but it doesn't hit it very reliably. Whereas high bias, high variance means it's all over the place and it's not even averaging the uh, hitting the target. Um, so you've, you've got all sorts of problems there. And this is a useful way of thinking about it because boosting is something which helps reduce bias. Because when bias is detected in the model, the weights are adjusted to try to compensate for that. So if you're consistently off target in a particular direction, then boosting should help um, nudge your model closer to target. So it should mean that your classifiers get better at the job they're supposed to do. And bagging helps reduce variance. So by resampling, so essentially increasing the effective size of the training set, it should be possible to reduce the variability of the outcomes. So the advantage of decision trees, I mean, they are, I think, quite simple to understand and to interpret, and they're quite useful for scenario analysis. You can combine them with other classification methods if you want. Um, you don't really need to do much of the data beforehand. You don't even need to have complete data when you're, when you're using them. And as we've seen, you can use them for both categorical and for continuous data. And importantly, because you're looking at things, particularly on the continuous side, where you've got a cutoff value, 
if you've got non-linearity, if you've got outliers, it shouldn't really affect the results too much because it's not the magnitude of the uh, numbers that you're looking at. It's whether which side of a particular boundary they fall, which is important. But there are some disadvantages as well. I mean, if you've got more than um, two categories, um, then you've, you do potentially have some bias problems. And if you've got a large number of classes relative to the training set, it doesn't work very well. It can also get quite computationally expensive to train the tree if you're having to, to run through um, a large number of categories to try to calculate the entropy for every possible um, point in each of those sub data sets. That can get, that can get quite uh, tricky. And complex trees are generally overfitted trees, and if they're overfitted, they're often not great predictors. There's also the risk that small variations in the training data can lead to unstable results. I mean, you can see that from the difference between the entropy and the Gini trees. They have quite different structures. So if you think just changing the data could also lead to that kind of level of instability, that just needs to be borne in mind that you want to be happy that you are using something which is at least reasonably robust. And also, whilst you don't need to worry about um, non-linearity or non-linear relationships between the variables, if there are clear, strong non-linear relationships, then decision trees can't actually um, work with these or take these into account at all. So on the one hand, it's a pro because you don't need to model it. On the other hand, it's a con because um, if there's useful information you're missing, it can't take advantage of it. So that's it for decision trees. I hope you found this uh, short series useful as everything else. Um, and I will be back with some more videos, um, hopefully in the not too distant future.